desire to set records, prove himself, place himself at the topmost point of his dream, Victory Circle. Sands of Daytona, the world's most famous beach. Fifty weeks a year, this Florida resort town basks in sunshine and listens to the quiet sounds of the surf. At high tide, the Atlantic scours the wide, smooth beach with the pressure of a million tons of water and suspended sand. The sand is dropped before the surf retreats, and at low tide, the sand dries to become a great natural superhighway, 300 feet wide, 20 miles long. One mile of this beach, one measured mile, becomes the most important spot in America for automakers, drivers, and mechanics. For 14 days, every major American stock car and many European manufacturers race the clock in flying mile and acceleration tests. When these tests are complete, the course is changed to include the asphalt road running parallel to the beach, and the 160-mile Grand National is then ready to run. First, attention focuses on the flying mile. At the starting line, a Pontiac, brought to Daytona by a young man who has set the pace of the racing world by owning the cars which won the last two Indianapolis 500-mile classics. John Zink, who usually hires professional drivers, is testing this one out himself in a one-way, unofficial run. Zink begins his one-way run. And so all the marks, 141.2 miles an hour. The fastest time ever recorded on this beach by an American passenger car. That's the mark all the others must shoot for. But roaring down the beach in a straightaway run, at better than 130 miles an hour, anything can happen. Look out! Bill Norcutt is trapped in the wreck, his seat belt held, and rescue workers must cut him loose. He's on his feet, walking away. Race day, and the Air Force salutes the fastest field ever to compete at Daytona Beach. The largest crowd in Daytona history watches the Air Force show before turning to the bigger show shaping up on the sands. The pace lap of the Grand National Beach and Road Race. 58 high performance stock cars parade down the two mile long beach straightaway. Then wheel into the north turn. Pontiac. Oldsmobile and Mercury with multiple carburetors, superchargers on Ford, high compression Plymouth, Chevrolets with fuel injection, all battling for Victory Circle. They're moving down the backstretch now, a two-lane asphalt road that will know speeds of 130 miles an hour before the day is over. This 160-mile event will give a car more punishment than three years driving on the highway. This is the Grand National, the grand challenge for endurance, for power, for performance. Here they come into the south turn, and the green flag, the race is on.
through the south turn, Banjo Matthews in number eight, first car off the turn, booming down the beach straightaway. The pace car gets out of the way as Matthews sends his car screaming north at 125 miles an hour. But there's a challenge. Cotton Owens in number six moves into second place. And he's passing to take the lead. Number six with Owens at the wheel leading as number 47 comes up to second place. turn. Bob Duell runs number 95 up the bank and out of the race. The leaders hit the beach together and Owens chief mechanic Ray Nichols keeps his fingers crossed. Owens in number six putting a lot of beach between himself and the second place car. Look at him go. Coming through the pack from 20th starting position, Paul Goldsmith giving his number three a furious ride. Owens leads the way. But as they come back on the beach, number 85 is second and closing in. Oh, there's a spin and another. Number 85 slams into the spinning car. That's all the racing he'll do today. There's another car in trouble. And Paul Goldsmith coming through. Just look at that man drive. He's in second place. Tiny Worley, co-mechanic on the lead car, is worried. Pocket radios tuned to the race broadcast tell the crew Goldsmith has closed in on Owens on the backstretch. There they are. Number three and number six screaming north on the beach at 126 miles an hour. Look out, fast cars coming through. Goldsmith takes the lead. There's a car in trouble. This is the fastest race ever run on this beach and road course and some can't take it. Hey, where did everybody go? The course gets rougher as the afternoon wears on. Goldsmith gives number three a jolting ride to stay in front. Owens, a former winner here, knows the beach like the back of his hand. He whips his car through the north turn less than a half a minute behind number three. Ray Nichols. Owens' chief mechanic spent weeks tearing down, testing, and reassembling Owens' engine. Will it stand the strain of this all-out drive? Here comes Goldsmith. And there's Owens closing in. Uh oh it looks like Goldsmith is having some kind of trouble. Goldsmith suddenly loses speed, and Owens sets his sights on a trail of blue-gray smoke down the backstretch. Where's number three? The stopwatches show he must be slowing down. Goldsmith limps into the pits, giving up first place. Owens in number six grabs the lead. Goldsmith's crew raise the hood. There's a burn piston. They tried to squeeze just a little too much power out of that engine. It was a great race while it was running, but that's all for today. Ray Nichols signals that the pressure is off, telling Owens to take it easy. But Owens is running for a record. His average speed is better than 101 miles an hour. A new Grand National record. And he's roaring toward the checkered flag. 
He's on his last lap. Owens in number six takes the checkered flag. A triumphal turn over the four mile beach and road course, then to Victory Circle with a new record of 101.6 miles an hour. Mechanic Nichols, long a user of perfect circle piston rings at the Indianapolis Speedway, depended on them here in setting up the engine that brought him to Daytona's Victory Circle. For more than 40 years, drivers and mechanics have stormed the beach at Daytona in search of victory. But today, the newest metal cars are tested at another 40-year-old race course. Cars as new and advanced as jet aircraft. Cars which explore new boundaries of speed. Run at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Each year, the best mechanics and drivers in the world challenge the giant two and a half mile track in the fastest race in the world, the Indianapolis 500. Here, the newest designs are tested. Here, in Gasoline Alley, the big cars are assembled. Newest car, is George Sally's number nine. Its engine placed on its side for a lower center of gravity. Let's hear what the driver Sam Hanks has to say about it. George Sally has been thinking about this new design of his for some five years. George knows as much about an engine's performance as anybody in the business. He works as a foreman at the Myron Drake factory where they make most of the engines that run at the speedway. In last year's car, the one I bought into second place, and in this terrific new car, George uses perfect circle piston rings. All the mechanics that have set up the winners here for as long as I can remember have used perfect circle rings. It's the best way to get top performance out of any engine as far as I'm concerned. Race day. The Purdue University band marches into the main straightaway to entertain 200,000 racing fans from 48 states and a dozen nations. This is the world's biggest paid admission sporting event. Reserved grandstand seats were sold out months ago. Last night, thousands slept in their cars outside the speedway, then raced for the general admission to the infield when the gates opened at 5 o'clock this morning. The balloons are released, and the crowd suddenly grows still. This is the day, the hour, the final minute. Tony Holman, Speedway president, speaks the historic command. Gentlemen, start your engine. position winner, ready to lead them out. The Mercury pace car swings onto the track. The pace lap begins. In a new type start, all cars leave their pits single file and form into rows on the track. From the tower terrace, overlooking the main straightaway, instructions are transmitted by RCA equipment to camera crews stationed around the track. Into the first turn, the Mercury pace car picks up speed in the short straightaway leading to the second turn. Driving the pace car is F.C. Reed, general manager of the Mercury division of the Ford Motor Company. His only passenger is Speedway President Tony Holman. The pace car tradition started here 33 years ago when Henry Ford served as starter for the 1924 race. The parade swings up the long backstretch. The next time these cars come through here, they'll be traveling better than 175 miles an hour. Of the 33 cars in the starting lineup, 18 are new machines in competition for the first time. Through the third turn, the tension growing, five drivers are in their first Indianapolis race. Here they come. 
the fourth turn, and the field enters the main straightaway. They'll hit the starting line at better than 120 miles an hour. The Mercury pace car streaks into the pit area, and the race is on! Connors number 12 roars away from the pole position to the lead. The field settles into the groove in the first turn. The second turn, O'Connor full throttle. Up the back stretch. O'Connor moving away. The third turn, Fred Agabasian challenging. And as they move into the fourth turn, Troy Ruttman blasts his way into third place. Jimmy Bryan's pit crew count off the leaders at the end of lap one. The national champion is seventh. O'Connor is turning corners at 136 miles an hour. Heading for the backstretch, Agabation eases off as Ruttman sends A.J. Watson's machine screaming into second place. Ruttman is coming fast. Suddenly, the crowd roars. Paul Russo has sent the Novi screaming through the field. As Rutman takes the lead, the Novi special comes up to fourth. Sam Hanks is fifth. Rutman tries to increase his lead, but on the backstretch, the V8 supercharged Novi edges closer. Through the turns, the big Novi must hold position, but on the straightaway, it travels 180 miles an hour and takes second place. Can the Novi get past Rutman? Hank's little yellow car is fourth behind O'Connor and fights him down the backstretch. Russo goes screaming into the main straightaway, alone. Where's Rutman? Rutman heading into the pits. He's slipping out of his seat harness. After only 30 miles, this new car is out of the race. Hanks goes screaming past O'Connor. With Brutman out, this puts Hanks in second place. The no-buy mechanic wonders, is that little yellow car a challenge to the supercharged giant? There's Hanks right behind him and gaining. In a burst of straightaway speed, the Novi gains. But in the turns, Hanks, in a lower, lighter car, closes in once more. Coming out of the backstretch, Hanks leads. But the Novi screams past him at 180 miles an hour. The third turn. Hanks passing to take the lead. Now, can he hold it? Hanks stays in first place. Russo and the Novi can't catch him. 400 miles still to go. Cutting through the field from 32nd starting position, Jim Rathman in number 26. His move almost lost in the excitement of the duel for the lead. Russo is in the pits for fuel and fresh tires. Hanks is moving away. Russo, 43-year-old grandfather, has 11 races behind him, but none tougher. Refueled and three new tires, the Novi rolls again in 43 seconds. He's in second place, three quarters of a lap behind the fleeing Hanks. Raffman pits. The chiropractic special is a new car, the lightest on the track, and one of the fastest through the corners. Fuel, four tires, and away in 33 seconds. As Rathman hurtles out of the pits, Russo screams by. Rathman's quick pit stop has brought him within eight seconds of second place. Hanks cuts his way through the slower cars, stretching his lead, before making his first pit stop. Russo charging. 
Right behind him, Rathman, closing in. Hanks heading for the pits. He's covered the first 100 miles in 43 minutes. A new record. His average speed, better than 141 miles an hour. But Hanks doesn't know it. His crew has not been flashing his speed. His instrument panel is disconnected. It's up to Hanks and the experience of more than 4,000 miles in competition on this track. Forty-three seconds. Hanks is away and in the lead. Designer, mechanic, owner. George Sally's every hope is running in that machine. Russell's no by still in second, but right behind him, Rathman in number 26 is closing in. Rathman passing. He's in second place and his crew sense he's just beginning to run. Rathman's chiropractic special roars away after Hanks. Hanks' crew warned the front runner, Rathman is gaining. <laughs> Two cars spin. Al Keller in the Bardahl special spins into the wall. Johnny Thompson misses a head-on crash by inches after turning a complete loop in the infield. Keller's not injured but the field is slowed until the track is cleared. Rathman pits for the second time. His pit crew sets to work changing three tires and refueling. These men have made a science out of pit stops. 10 seconds. Twenty seconds. Thirty seconds. Rathman is on his way in thirty-three seconds. Hanks is in for his second pit stop, with Rathman less than a half a lap behind. takes the lead. Hanks is on his way in second place, less than 10 seconds behind, and a job to do to catch the fastest man in the race. Rathman has turned one lap at 143.4 miles an hour. Hanks is getting traction like a mail train coming through the corners. Hanks closes in at the 350 mile mark. Coming through the second turn, he's moving up the pass. Hanks takes back the lead. That new design works. Three seconds. Can Hanks hold it? Don Edmund spins out. Only 18 of the starting field of 33 are still running. The yellow flag slows the race until the track is clear. Hanks has a 10 second lead and only 15 laps to go. The track is cleared for high speed, but Rathman's crew tell him to take it easy. They want to be sure he'll finish. Hanks is running like a dream, turning the last few laps at 141 miles an hour. An incredible performance. Alice Hanks waits behind the pit railing just a few feet from George Sally and the crew. The white flag is out. Hanks begins his last lap. Jim Rathman's chiropractic special firmly in control of second place. Rathman's run from 32nd starting position has been a beauty. Hanks coming off the corners like a gunshot is roaring for the checkered flag. 
Sam Hanks wins the Indianapolis 500. Twenty-one seconds later, Rathman takes a checker. And one lap behind, Jimmy Bryan, national champion, places third. One minute ahead of Paul Russell's Novi, running fourth. Here he comes, the 42-year-old winner of the 41st Indianapolis 500. And there isn't a man along the pit wall that isn't happy for him. His average speed for 500 miles was better than 135 miles an hour. Five miles an hour faster than the old record. There are tears in his eyes as Hanks wheels into victory lane where his wife, his pit crew, and George Sally wait for him. This is a dream come true for driver and mechanic. Other men, designing still newer experimental machines, will take heart from this victory. For men who build and design automobiles are never content. Hank's share of the $300,000 purse, the largest in racing, is more than $103,000, which, added to prize money won in past 500s, makes Hank's the biggest money winner in Indianapolis history. With this victory, Hanks announced his retirement from Speedway competition. His experimental car proved it could go the distance against top challengers. Sam Hanks, his crew, his car, have earned their place in victory circle. Sam Hanks' car and eight of the first 10 finishers were equipped with perfect circle piston rings, the brand most people prefer.